Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, a very important subject, the conversion of thermal energy. Uh, this is going to take uh, two or three weeks for, for us to cover this subject. And uh, we'll focus further on on biomass, biogas, and solar th uh, thermal power plants. However, today, I will be talking about the theoretical framework and also the historical context. I'm going to try to introduce this subject uh, in association with uh, its historical context. Okay, So why this is so important, why I said that this is a very important subject, you know that uh, most of our electrical energy, uh, the world electrical energy consumption, uh, comes from thermal conversion. Uh, I mean, conversion of uh, thermal energy into electricity by some special methods, which we will elaborate further on. Okay, so uh, I just uh, put this reminder here, 80% of the world's electrical energy generation, electrical energy generation comes from thermal conversion. Various types of uh, technologies for thermal conversion, which I will try to, to elaborate, okay? Uh, to, to elaborate a little bit more on this subject, let's take the, this uh, very recurrent figure. I'm going to be showing you this figure several times during this course. Uh, this is the, the U.S. energy use in uh, 2013. Actually, this is a very interesting figure because first it, it's a Sankey diagram, so we we have a very good idea of the sources and the destination, the uses of energy. Okay, and uh, well, it's also representative of the world's consumption, the, the world average consumption, because you know uh, the Brazilian uh, grid, the Brazilian uh, matrix, as we say here in Brazil is kind of different. So that's why I use uh, sometimes these kind of, of pictures. So you can see in a Sankey diagram, you have the energy sources, solar, nuclear, hydropower, wind, and so on. And on the right, you have the destinations or the, or the sectors that are consuming energy. You see the residential sector, commercial, industrial, and transportation. So uh, when you look at electricity generation and when you look at the sources uh, first of all you see that uh, you have nuclear nuclear energy which is also uh, a thermal source you have hydropower and so on uh, which is not a thermal source okay and the same thing you can track for instance the using in in industry you use a lot of natural gas in industry. So that's how you, you interpret this kind of, of graph. Uh, as far as electricity generation is regarded, you know, uh, most of uh, the conversion of thermal sources to electricity is done through a Rankine or a Brighton cycle. I, I, my intention is to, to um, explain what is a Rankine or a Brighton cycle. This is going to be done today, and we're going to do some calculations also. But if you look at the sources of electricity generation, the main sources, you see nuclear uh, is a non-renewable source. Uh, um, it's, uh, in a strict sense, it's non-renewable, but uh, you have uh, supply for thousands of years. Okay, But you see uh, uh, natural gas in coal, or non-renewable sources, and they uh, play a very important role in uh, electricity generation. You also have um, hydropower, wind power, and a little bit of biomass here, uh, which are renewable sources uh, for electricity generation. Now, if you look at uh, the transportation sector, which is not electricity, but also uses uh, thermal cycles like the auto cycle, the diesel, or even the Brighton cycle. Uh, the most, uh, the major contribution comes from petroleum. So, so petroleum is uh, essentially a fuel, a fuel source 
for the transportation sector. Uh, you see a very small amount of elect electricity being used in the transportation sector, 0 0.025, 26, which is for electrical trains, for instance, like it is, it is shown here. So you see that uh, you have a lot of thermal conversion here, also here. See, the, what's not thermal conversion is uh, electricity and possibly wind, for, but it's not uh, significant, okay? So, uh, Rankine, Brighton, Auto, Diesel, and Brighton cycles are uh, cycles of conversion of thermal energy to, to exit your uh, organized form of, of energy. If, uh, you can think of electricity. Moving further, uh, and this is also important, you remember I said in the first, uh, first class when I talked about uh, the climate change and transition of the, of the matrix grid, it, it would be interesting to be able to uh, construct a negative carbon cycle uh, because, you know, uh, fossil sources like petroleum, coal and gas will remain uh, for a lot of time in the world scenario because of the new technologies and so on. So uh, it would also be very interesting if we develop a, ne a negative cycle uh, in which you still can produce energy. Okay, So it, that's a slide from the first class, which I'm bringing it here to, to remind you the importance of thermal conversion. We need to produce energy, organized energy, exergy, and uh, also we would like to, to inject CO2 uh, in the underground in order to, to retain it, okay, in order to decrease the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, and that's so, uh, I don't know if you remember this slide, uh, doing, by doing so you are able to collect CO2 from several uh, producers and uh, this, this company will operate a, an inverse well, inverted well, or an injection well. It's going to inject CO2 in the underground, okay? So, uh, just to give you some, some information and some references what to read, most of, um, many things I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm giving you in this course, not only in this class, comes from this very, very excellent book by Daniel Jürgen, uh, which, in which he, he describes the evolution of energy systems, technologies, regulation, and markets. So it's not a, a very, uh, I mean, scientific uh, book, but it gives a lot of information about the, the story, how, how our energy systems evolved during, during the last uh, 150 years, for instance. Okay. Uh, well, let's start by stating what is actually the problem, what I call the, uh, the problem of converting energy uh, or a disorganized form of energy. Thermal energy is a disorganized form of energy. What is the problem of converting it into uh, mechanical energy, which is a form of organized energy? And for that, we give a special name. We give this name exergy. If you're not uh, familiar with this term, there is no problem. You can simply think in electricity or kinetic energy. Electricity for, for appliances, for instance, for using appliances, and kinetic energy for the use in, uh, in the transportation sector. Okay. So what is the problem when we try to, to engineer systems for this conversion? This, this question, I'm, we're going to answer it today, and it is related to the second law of thermodynamics, which we, I will show you in a few slides. And it is also related to the, what we call the arrow of time, okay? I mean, the fact that the time always moves uh, forward is related to uh, a certain uh, limit of, of, of this conversion, of the, for the efficiency of this conversion, okay? That's, uh, in a few words, a quick glance in what we're going to see further on. 
Um, and I also want to show you uh, a demonstration of a thermal conversion. I brought this uh, small machine here. I don't, I don't know if you can, can see it. Actually, it's one of those. I'm going to go back some, some slides. It's a kind of a, a one of those cycles, auto diesel brighton. This is actually what we call a Stirling cycle. So this is a Stirling machine. And it's a machine for the conversion of thermal energy, which may, may be coming from the, the guy's hand here. OK, so it takes the heat from from the hand of the, the person holding the, the machine, the Stirling machine, and it converts this heat to kinetic energy. So uh, I brought also some uh, hot water for my tea, and I'm going to show you how this works in a, in a few seconds. Because if I use the heat of my hand, it's going to, to take a little while for the machines to, to start to turn. So I'm going to leave it here for, for a while, and I'm going uh, further, and then I'll stop to show you the machine working. But what's happening here, let me explain in a little more details. Heat is being converted, heat from the hand or from, uh, from the bottle that you, I hope you can see it here. Let me see if the guys from YouTube manage to see that. Yeah, they will. <laughs> okay. So heat is being transformed into kinetic energy. And that's the subject of today's class. We're going to study, we're going to write down all the, the equations and so on. Okay. Let me see if it's already turning. Yeah. So you see that uh, it's getting heat from the hot water, and it's it's not uh, working yet, but it will in a few moments. I'm going to to move a little bit further, and then I'll stop to show you the the, the demonstration. Okay. So uh, before going to the theoretical framework. I'm going to give you a perspective on the what what I call a historical context, starting by uh, or focusing on the disruptive improvements in the use of energy. This is very important. The first uh, disruptive use of energy was the control of fire for food cooking, uh, uh, especially for thermal processing the food that we ingest. I already mentioned that, but I, I'm, I want to give you a little um, bit more details uh, because actually what happened, uh, you know, the control of fire didn't happen suddenly. Actually, it is the result of uh, incremental technolo technological improvements starting by uh, the control. We learned how to transport transport from uh, uh, burned to unburned areas. I mean, to, to transport fire, that's uh, something that we, we didn't know how to start a fire, so we, got, we had to collect this fire somewhere and to transport this, this uh, chemical reaction to the place where we want to use it. Uh, also, the uh, next evolutionary step was we learned how to, st to start the fire, and uh, we also built hats and other uh, kinds of fire enclosures in order to to render the use of fire more efficient. And also we learned how to maintain uh, for a long period of time, maintain this chemical reaction for a long period of time, uh, sufficient for cooking uh, grains, for instance. So uh, this uh, can be stated as our first disruptive use of uh, energy, actually. Uh, the second important step was the use of, uh, let's say, wind or, or for water pumping, grain processing, for propulsion, uh, uh, already mentioned in the transportation sector. And if we leap to, to only uh, 200 or 300 years from today, we see that uh, uh, during the, actually during the Victorian area, we learned how to do this conversion of, of thermal energy, which is a very abundant and easy to get source of energy, to uh, work. Uh, and when I say work, I mean uh, force times displacement, mechanical energy. 
Okay, so we learned to, how to do that during this period. We're going to see that in a little while. And after learning how to convert heat to work, we developed uh, general purpose engines, uh, also machines uh, like mechanical looms, tractors, excavators, and so on. Uh, so uh, this evolution here actually um, revolutionized our society. Okay, the control of fire revolutionized, revolutionized, um, uh, represented a revolution in our evolution. You know, or I said in the first class that our even our brain uh, was configured differently because we had a, access to a, a lot more uh, food. Uh, but this changes here during the Industrial Revolution actually re completely revolutionized our society. I'm going to show you that in, in a few slides. Let me see if uh, my machine is already working. Uh, okay, you see that it's, uh, it's turning. So, uh, I don't know if you hear the sound, but uh, it's taking energy from the hot water. No, there, so there's a flow of energy. It's, it's collecting energy from the bottom. Uh, somehow, this, this heat is being converted to a mechanical movement uh, that you can see. Uh, the, the wheel is turning. And also, a very important uh, aspect of this conversion is that uh, some amount, some finite amount of heat must be rejected to the environment. So this, this heat rejection is occurring on the top of the machine, where I'm, where I'm with my finger with. Okay, so uh, we're going to to write down all the equations and see uh, if uh, it is possible or not to to avoid rejecting heat. Because you know, uh, if you reject heat to the environment, this uh, amount of energy is not being converted to mechanical energy. So ideally, it would be interesting. Uh, not to reject, to reject zero energy to the environment. Okay, I'm going to show you that this is not possible. Uh, if you ask me because or why, I would say because uh, because time always flows uh, forward. Uh, I'm going to be able. I'm not. I'm not going to be able to to elaborate on that. But uh, the reasons are closely related. Okay, so I'm going to leave the machine. Just here, it will be turning during during my my talk. Okay, so uh, coming back to our slides and moving moving on, uh, these these changes here resulted in what we call industrial revolution, which we can say started uh, one aspect one one of the aspects of uh, the industrial revolution that I want to focus on. Uh, thermal energy conversion, we could say that it started in the United Kingdom, in, in the coal mines of the United Kingdom. Now you see it here. Uh, the problem in these mines was that uh, you start digging uh, deeper and deeper, as you, as you can see here, I don't know if you can see, as you started to dig deeper and deeper uh, to get coal, what happened is that you have water that started to to seep and accumulate uh, in these galleries. So you have to have uh, some kind of system to drain this water from the underground in order to, to uh, enable for the miners to work and to, to, to get uh, the coal. Okay? So uh, in, the, in the beginning, uh, this water drainage was done by, by animals or even by humans. Uh, but uh, as these mines started to grow, you, uh, animals or a man couldn't, uh, couldn't, uh, didn't have the enough power in order to remove the amount of water that was increasing and increasing. Okay, so the first thermal machines were developed. Uh, as you can see here, we're going to uh, see uh, the machine. Uh, a cable and uh, which goes down to the mine okay and you see the coal here being fed to the thermal machine the first of uh, let's say the first of these machines 
was uh, Thomas Savory's machine. Uh, the important point is, is the date in, in 1698. Uh, actually, it was uh, a very uh, a very strange machine and a very inefficient machine, but uh, it was better than having, uh, let's say, 100 horses uh, side by side trying to pull all the water that was seeping uh, into the mine. Uh, actually, this machine by by Thomas Savory is uh, is a vacuum machine, so it's different from from this machine that I'm, I'm showing you here, uh, and it used uh, the the vacuum produced in different chambers. So this this chamber here, uh, you produce vacuum, and this this low pressure actually sucks the water from from the, the bottom of the mine. We can see this effect uh, also in Thomas Newcomen machine, which is a little bit better than uh, Thomas Savory's machine. Uh, it, we have a, a, an animation here on the right. I'm not going to bother you uh, with this de these details now. We're going to see it in very much details in a few moments. But you see that uh, there's some point in the cycle in which uh, this, this pink steam, the, the steam is represented in pink. So I, I don't know if you can see, but uh, there's a specific moment in which you inject liquid water and this liquid water promotes the condensation of this steam. So this condensation creates a vacuum, actually a low pressure inside the piston and uh, the atmospheric pressure actually uh, pushes the, the piston down. So uh, these machines, uh, Thomas Savory's and New Commons, are called atmospheric machines. The effect that I'm showing you here can be seen in this uh, small movie. Uh, we can reproduce this uh, at home. You see, you, you have a, a can, you put some water, then you heat, in order to produce steam inside the, the, the can, uh, and also to eliminate the amount of air inside. When you cool, cool that, you see that uh, steam condenses inside the, the bottle and the atmospheric pressure crushes the, the can. Okay, uh, we can see that in slow motion. So that's the, the same effect that uh, these first uh, machines used. It's, you can do that at your homes. It's very easy. Okay, very easy to do. You don't you don't need to use ice, as it's shown here. You can use simply uh, water from the tap. It's enough for for the condensation of the steam inside the can. Okay. Uh, next, a very important uh, evolution was obtained by James Watt in 1763. Uh, and what, what, what he did was to separate the condenser, and this increased very, very much the efficiency of the conversion of energy. Uh, the, let me go back some, some slides. The problem with uh, Savory's and also uh, New Commons machine was that the consumption of, of heat and the consum consumption of coal was was uh, very very significant for a given amount of uh, work produced so that was a problem a, a very big problem actually and it was solved by james watt uh, by building a very efficient machine uh, and for that he he simply separated the condenser from the the piston let me just cancel okay. So, uh, moving further, when Watt uh, managed to develop a very efficient machine, what, what this caused was the development of general purpose engines, like, like this one in the picture here. In this, by general purpose, I mean engines suitable for the application in the transportation sector and so on and so forth. And this actually represented a very, very important revolution. First, in the, in the transportation sector, you can uh, imagine the, the effect, the revolutionizing effect that uh, a tractor 
represents for, for agriculture, for instance. Uh, you can uh, do the calculations. What is, what is the amount of work that a horse can produce by, by uh, pulling a plow, for instance, for, for, for plowing the soil? You can multiply that by, by 10, by 50. That's the capacity of a steam tractor. So this represented actually a very uh, important increase in food production. Actually, uh, the, the historians say that the Thomas Malthus bomb actually was disarmed by the invention of the steam tractor. Uh, also, uh, navigation. Uh, you know that um, uh, before the use of steam, you, you have to rely on wind power to, to, for the proportion of boats. So you need wind. Uh, to go from, from A to B, you always need wind. When you have uh, steam, if you have steam, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't need wind. You, you need some fuel, wood or coal, and that's okay. No? You have a lot of, of uh, coal, but also a lot of uh, uh, wood. And you also could navigate uh, through rivers. Okay. I don't know somebody's trying to call me here. <laughs> okay. So also this represented a, a very important revolution, especially in, in the, the exchange of uh, goods. Uh, you, can, you can think about, for instance, the impact that this represented in, in the United States, for instance. You know, uh, cattle was raised in, in the interior near Texas and Oklahoma, and uh, the most important markets were in New York and uh, Los Angeles, for instance. So, uh, with the use of boats, you manage to transport this, this meat to, to the sea through the Mississippi River in, and then um, to New York, for instance. So this represented a very important revolution in, in commerce in, uh, and also in terms of health. Okay? You can, uh, can you figure the, the impact that a steam excavator had in, in, in the cities. Uh, because with steam excavators, you were able to build canals and, uh, for draining sewage. And this represented a very uh, positive impact in people's health. Also, the use of steam excavators enabled uh, the construction, as you see here, of the Suez Canal in 1869 and with the Suez Canal you know you didn't have to you don't have any more to go from uh, United Kingdom Kingdom to India for instance you don't have to go all the way down to South Africa and then to India you just uh, uh, you short your your trip in I don't know six months or one year I, I don't I'm inventing numbers actually <laughs> okay and uh, not only the Suez Canal, but also the Panama Canal in 1881. And you see the, the picture here of a steam excavator. This, these constructions, the Suez Canal and the, the Panama Canal, represented uh, major, major engineering uh, feats, actually, at a, at a time. And it wasn't possible without this kind of machine. Uh, the Swiss Canal, the story of the Swiss Canal is a very interesting. If you have uh, the opportunity of watching a, a documentary or something like that, it's a very, very interesting um, thing to see, uh, the construction of uh, the Panama Canal, because it's closely related to, to actually to, to politics. You see here, uh, actually, the, the, the country called Panama was created because Colombia didn't want to, didn't agree with the United States, uh, didn't want to let the United States build the, the Panama Canal. Okay, so there's uh, interesting stories about that, and also related to the to the plague, actually, uh, to yellow fever. You see that uh, a very very important problem, which the French, because the French constructed the Suez Canal. They tried to construct the Panama Canal, and they they didn't uh, man, they they didn't succeed. 
because of yellow fever. Uh, and then when the United States bought the concession to build the Panama Canal, the first thing they did was uh, try to eradicate the yellow fever. And this was done by Theodore Roosevelt, the president here. And if you don't remember him, you, I'm sure you remember the movie. What's the name? Uh, A Night at the Museum or something like that. And this character here actually was uh, uh, President Roosevelt, a very, very interesting character, okay? Uh, but also uh, the use of steam, the, the possibility of conversion, converting thermal energy to mechanical energy enable the development of uh, machine tools or, or mechanical looms as it's shown here. Uh, you see the, uh, you have the mechanical energy coming in this ax here, which is transferred to the looms through these um, rubber belts or tissue belts, okay? And the story of the loom actually is, is very interesting because it leads to the development of the computer. It's, it's very surprising, but the development of the computer is related to the mechanical loom. And that started with Jacquard, a French guy who developed uh, the programmable loom. So he, he coded the drawings that you want to, to put in the tissue were programmed in, uh, in wood cards, punched wood cards, like the first uh, punch computer's first uh, punch cards. And this technology actually, uh, well, the programmable loom is a machine that you can, if you change the program, the set of, of cards here, you change the figure that's going to be uh, drawn here, okay? And that's exactly what the computer uh, does, okay? So the development of the mechanical and programmable loom led to the development of the computer, okay? Uh, but let's try to generalize a little bit what we have said already. Um, remember, I'm talking about the disruptive improvements in the use of energy. So I'm talking about uh, exergy, which we can think as mechanical work or electricity or kinetic energy for large scale production of goods, food, clothing, utensils, etc., and for broadening the access to services such as transportation, illumination, heating, etc. Okay, so what do you think this represents in terms of social changes? You know, this, uh, this is possible only because you have this kind of thermal uh, machine, or converted, uh, machine that is capable of converting thermal energy to mechanical work, okay? So this represented, uh, this led to the, what we call the Industrial Revolution, uh, which led to a better quality of life. Okay, and by better quality of life, I mean in a, an objective sense, because this can be measured through uh, longevity, education, and income. So we, this, all these, let me see. <laughs> okay. So all these, are, all these consequences led to higher longevity, better education, and increase in people's income. So you, have, you can uh, quantify that through the HDA index, okay? Uh, another reference that I want to give you is this book, a very interesting book, very, very interesting. I really recommend, the, both books are very good. I really recommend them. But this one describes the history of the evolution of the STEAM technology and the corresponding social consequences because they are very closely related. This is a very, uh, I really would recommend you to, to read these books if you're interested in these subjects, okay? But uh, we're talking about energy, we're talking about its social impacts, we're talking about uh, how to use, how to convert different types of energy. But, you know, what is energy? That's a, a very interesting question. If you look in, in um, books and even 
uh, even um, good references, you often find this kind of definition. Is the capacity to do work, and by work we mean force times displacement, or torque times uh, rotation, okay? Uh, so this definition actually represents a, a problem because work also is energy, okay? It's mechanical energy. So it's like saying that energy is energy. So this actually uh, does, does not answer our, our question. So I want to discuss a little bit this, this subject. And uh, another reference, uh, during this class, you know, I'm going to be using some concepts which are um, elaborated in this course of thermodynamics and particularly the calculations that we're going to do and, and also the concepts are in these two classes, Introduction to the First Law of Thermodynamics and uh, Thermodynamic Properties and uh, State Diagrams. They are in Portuguese, I don't have in, in English these this videos. But uh, if you're interested, uh, this is a complete course on thermodynamics, which is entirely in video. You can, you can use this reference if you want, okay? But uh, today's subject is covered in, in this class and also in, in this uh, third class here, okay? So when we try to, to figure out what is energy, we can, uh, first we recognize that there are different types of energy, okay? Uh, I already mentioned we have organized types of energy, disorganized types of energy, but we also can uh, ask ourselves, uh, for instance, okay, I know that uh, heat is a kind of uh, uh, disorganized energy, but what is heat? You know, in the past, people thought, people assumed that heat was a self-repellent fluid called caloric. You know? So that's the orange uh, origin of the word calor in Portuguese. It comes from the Latin caloric, which was this kind of fluid, this magic fluid, uh, which self-repels itself uh, and was associated with heat. Another important question is, what is mechanical work? What is mechanical energy in terms of force times displacement? Another significant question is, is it possible to convert different types of energy, heat to work, work to heat, and so on? Uh, are there efficiency limits to these conversions? Can I convert heat to energy with 100% efficiency and convert work to heat with 100% efficiency. We're going to see that uh, this is not always the case. Uh, also, different types of energy can perform equivalent amounts of work. So, so all of these questions were in the heads of the, the researchers of the time, and I'm going to try to, to put ourselves in, in their shoes and try to, to reason as they uh, reason in the, back in the past, okay? So, uh, but here and now we can state uh, what I call working definition of energy, uh, like this. Energy is an abstract quantity with which we can express quantitative laws governing natural physical phenomena. For instance, the law of conservation of energy, okay? Uh, any transformation is ruled by the conservation of, of energy law, okay, the law of conservation of energy, and we can do calculations with that. So uh, this definition, the most important word here is abstract. By abstract, I mean that energy actually does not exist, okay? It's an abstract concept. It's like saying that energy is like the number one. The number one does not exist. It's an invention, an, an abstract invention, um, which we can use to count things, the number of birds in, in a tree, for instance, and make calculations. And so energy is exactly the, th the same thing. It's an abstract cons uh, concept, and we can use this concept to, to express quantitatively physical laws. And the physical laws they exist. 
So, so it's a way of expressing quantitatively these physical laws. Okay? So in this uh, moment, we are most concerned with this relation, the relation between transformation and energy. Why is that? Because, as I mentioned, um, we manage during time, during our evolution as, as, the human, as a human species, we manage to, to control the use of energy for practical applications. And these ap applications involve uh, transformation. For instance, transforming uh, raw uh, grains of bean into more digestible grains of bean. For that, we need heat. To, we need to thermal process these, these grains. Okay? Another type of transformation is uh, to transform um, a metal sheet into, I don't know, an appliance, for instance, uh, like pans for, for cooking. So in order to conform the, the metal sheet into the form of a pan, we need energy. We need actually mechanical energy. So to do any kind of transformation, actually, we need energy. So in that why, uh, since we, we managed to control very, very huge amounts of energy, we manage to, be, to, to make very, very huge transformations. Okay? Uh, and this is done in nature in most, uh, many, many kinds of applications. Uh, um, a leaf, for instance, do exactly this. It captures the energy of the sun, transforms that into, into biomass, for instance, and, well, uh, and you, ha you also have uh, some, some consequences, let's say, like that. Okay, so it's a transformation. Light is tra energy associated with light is transformed in energy associated in biomass. Okay? Uh, also, uh, cells fermenting uh, uh, can do that. Okay? Uh, let me go quick here. We do that in our bodies. Right? We take chemical energy and we transform in in uh, available energy for for moving our muscles and uh, for respiration and so on and we also lose thermal energy here and this is exactly what a internal combustion engine do so it's a very similar uh, combustion reaction actually you take chemical energy from your fuel you transform that this chemical energy to mechanical energy in the, um, uh, in the X here, okay, it's going to be transformed into kinetic energy, but you also lose thermal energy. We're going to see that it is impossible not to lose some amount of thermal energy because we know that energy must be conserved, so the ideal scenario would be to convert 100% of this chemical energy to mechanical energy without losing any kind of uh, energy okay this is would this would be a 100 percent efficient conversion but i'm going to show you that this is impossible okay and the first person that tried to study that was jules uh, i'm sure you are aware of this uh, what they call uh, the, the the mechanical equivalent of heat uh, heat by heat i mean thermal energy Actually, Joule constructed this, this machine, uh, and by, by allowing this weight to decrease its height, uh, it pulls the rope here, it turns the blade, the agitator inside the, the calorimeter, and by, by uh, supplying a certain amount of mechanical energy, gravitational energy, gravitational energy, this, this resulted in an increase in temperatures, so consequently in, a, in an increase of thermal energy of the wa water surrounding the blades here. So, uh, in this experiment, work is totally converted to heat, to thermal energy. So, uh, and the equivalent calculated by Joule is, is given here, okay? The, the important question is how can we do the transformation in the opposite sense. Of course, this type of machine is not going to work, but we can always build something like this. And the idea 
And the question is, is it possible to convert 100% of heat to mechanical work? Okay. Uh, so we've, let's see how it's in more details, how it is done in a new Cummins machine. Let's see the, the specific cycles uh, in order to, to try to answer this question, if it's, if it's possible to convert 100% of heat uh, to work. Okay. The first uh, step, I'm not able to stop the, the cycle here, but you see the first step, the, the, the beginning of the cycle, starts with the injection of steam at high temperature and pressure into the piston. So you have a boiler down here. You see the, the pink fluid is steam. When the valve here opens, the steam goes inside the piston. So that's step one of the cycle. Step two consists in uh, promoting steam cons condensation by means of cool water injection, which creates a partial vacuum in the piston. I showed you that in a soda can. Okay, so this step two, uh, the injection of cold water is done by this valve here. So you see when it opens, you see a, a squirt <laughs> of liquid water inside the, the, the piston. And this liquid water, cold liquid water, mixed with hot steam, promotes the condensation of steam. So you have partial vacuum inside, and the atmospheric pressure pushes the piston down, which pulls the bucket of water at the bottom of the, the mine. Okay? And step three, uh, I'm, I already explained, through the action of atmospheric pressure, the piston is contracted, which pulls the rod down. Okay, and step four, the cycle is restarted. Okay, the problem at the time was that only a fraction of the heat is converted to work. Is it possible to develop a perpetual motion machine? I'm going to show you that if it, if it was possible to convert 100% of heat to mechanical work, it would be possible to construct a perpetual motion machine. And this actually is related to the second law of the thermodynamics. Okay, you know, just, just as a reminder, the first law of thermodynamics is related to energy conservation. And the second law is related with this efficiency, the, the efficiency of the conversion of heat to work. We're going to see that in a few moments. So uh, a very important person in this, in this, on all this development, was uh, Nicolas Sadi Carnot, which was a French military cadet. And, uh, well, actually, he asked himself the right questions and he uh, obtained very, very significant and important and consequential answers. First, he recognized that heat is a form of, uh, sorry, disorganized energy. It's inverted here. Okay, so heat is a form of disorganized energy. Uh, he also recognized that work is a form of organized energy. Sorry for the inversion. Okay. Uh, and this is the important part of, of Carnot's work. Uh, he, he demonstrated that work can be 100% converted to heat. But he showed that heat can be partially converted to work. This is astonishing and, uh, let's say, uh, surprising at the same time. I'm going to show you that. This is uh, Carnot's work. It's in, uh, the title is very interesting. Reflexion sur la puissance motrice du feu. Uh, reflections or thoughts about the mot motive uh, power of, of fire. Okay. Uh, we're going to come back in a few moments in Carnot's uh, thoughts. But uh, actually, it's a very sophisticated and elaborate uh, thought. And it starts by recognizing different forms of energy. You have microscopic forms, and microscopic, microscopic and microscopic forms okay, associated with a system. By system, let's let's uh, think in terms of uh, uh, a bunch of particles moving around and confined by 
a box, like, like it's shown here, okay? So these particles, they have individual velocities, but the, the resulting center of, of mass also may have uh, a velocity, okay, or what we call macroscopic velocity. Okay, so the macroscopic forms of energy it's, uh, is associated with the system center of mass relative to an inertial referential. So it's the, the well-known kinetic energy. So it's uh, half Portuguese, half English here. So we have kinetic energy and also potential energy. So V stands for the velocity of the center of mass. And Z is the height of, uh, of the center of mass. So these are actually organized forms of energy. The micro, mi, sorry, microscopic forms of energy are actually associated with the, with the individual motion of the particles that constitute the system. Okay, so you have molecular translation. This is uh, closely related to temperature. You also have rotation, you have vibration, chemical energy, nuclear energy. If you want to produce uh, energy by a chemical reaction, you break this, these liaisons here, okay, and you may have energy. If you break down the, the nucleus of these particles, you can have nuclear energy, okay? So these types of, of energies are also associated with what we call energy uh, models. Like uh, kinetic energy is associated with wind energy, potential energy to hydroelectric power, okay, so temperature, uh, like uh, geothermal or solar thermal, Chem uh, chemical energy is a, a thermal power, a general thermal power plant, which uh, burns some fuel in order to obtain heat, and nuclear power plants, okay, so Carnot started by recognizing this, and uh, well, he asked himself if it's possible to to build a perpetuum mobile, okay, like 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 in this picture here, okay. So this leads to the first law of thermodynamics, and before that, the second law of thermodynamics, which I'm going to show you, okay. So the first law of thermodynamics is actually an energy conservation uh, principle which is actually what we call an inventory, an energy inventory, okay? Like, like exactly the same thing that we do with our transaction account in, in our banks. So we, what, what is the law? The variation of the account balance is equal to the net income minus the net expenses. So we add all incomes, like salary or the incomes from a financial investment that we did. We subtract all the all our expenses, our, our expenses in the supermarket, uh, the electricity bill, and so on and so on. And the difference is the variation of our uh, account balance. Okay, Energy is exactly the same thing. We're going to add all energy inputs, we're going to subtract all energy outputs, and the difference is going to be the variation of the energy balance within the system. Well, that's exactly what uh, the first law says. Okay, So the first law of thermodynamics for open system, uh, I'm going to state this law because we're going to use uh, at the end of the class in order to, to analyze some systems. Okay, so I'm, we're going to develop some working equations uh, which we're going to use uh, at the end of this class and also in other classes in the future. Okay, so I need first to introduce a kind of a formalism uh, based on which we're going to write down our equations. Okay, so by system, I already said it's a, it's a definite amount of mass. Uh, surrounded by a boundary, okay? Surrounded by a boundary. This boundary can be, uh, it it's, does not need to exist. It can be a virtual or imaginary or mathematical surface enclosing an amount of mass and separating this amount of mass from the surroundings. 
So it's like the rocket here. You see, uh, we can uh, put this imaginary surface here. Okay, so this is our imaginary surface. Our system is the the rocket. I mean the fuel. You know the the from the bottom to here. All all this is fuel, energy, starch, and this is the payload. Okay. So this is a system. And one important aspect of this particular system is that you have mass flow through the boundary down here. Okay? So this is what we call open system. Okay, so just to be clear, an open system is a system uh, in which you have mass flow through the boundary. Okay, so that's the definition of an open system. And we're going to do our uh, banking balances on this system, this open system. Okay, so there's our system. That's the the imaginary. Let me get my pointer. Okay, uh, this uh, cloudy form here is the, the the imaginary surface that defines the boundary of the system. You see that you have energy flows through the boundary. In, in the form of heat and work, uh, energy entering, energy exiting the, the system, but you also have mass flows through the boundary of the system. Okay? And uh, well, with this flow, entering flow and with this exiting flow, you have energy being carried inside and carried out of the system. Okay, associated with thermal energy and also what we call flow work. Uh, why is that? Let me give you an example. You can suppose that you have a, a pool, okay, and you have hot water, a heated pool. You have hot water entering here. So even though the pool, the temperature of the pool, let's say 25 degrees, you may have hot water entering at 60 degrees here. Okay, so this uh, water comes with uh, a high amount of thermal energy, which will be uh, dispersed, which will be used to heat uh, all the, the water that is confined in the pool. Okay, so that's how thermal energy is associated with the, this input mass flow. And also, I don't know if my next slide states that, but uh, what we call flow work is uh, actually because you know the pressure inside the system may be different from the pressure outside of the system. Uh, so you may need to to exert a force in order for this mass to enter the system. Uh, so this uh, force, in order to equalize the pressure, is the, the associated with, with what we call flow work. Okay, so. Thermal energy transport associated with mass flow is actually the thermal energy or internal energy of the substance uh, associated with mass flow entering or leaving the control volume that must be accounted for in our balances. Okay, and flow work is a mechanical work, force times displacement necessary for an element of mass to be pushed into or pulled. Out to out of the system CV. The CV stands for control volume. Okay, so these are uh, amounts of energy that we need to account for in our calculations. Uh, and as I said, the the law of conservation of energy in the absence of nuclear reaction, okay, is that the total energy in entering the, the control volume equals the rate of change of, of the internal energy confined in the control volume. If you have steady state, the system is not changing during time. This means that there is no net variation in the system's internal energy, zero here, okay? And uh, this means that the total energy is entering the control volume is zero. This, and this means that uh, uh, the energy that enters is equal 
the energy that exits the, the system. In uh, mathematical terms, this can be expressed as, as it's shown here. Okay, so uh, theta is represents thermal energy, H is enthalpy, okay, which is a kind of uh, internal energy. Actually, let me just write down you an equation here, the definition of enthalpy. Enthalpy, by definition, is a kind of energy, okay? So, by definition, it's equals to the internal energy, and this is actually, it is temperature, plus pressure times volume, okay? And this is, this quantity here is associated with flow work, okay? So, uh, enthalpy is a useful definition of energy which combines the internal energy of the substance associated with the translational, translational movement of the particles of the system, okay, and also to the, to the amount, to the force necessary to push uh, this element of, of mass inside the, the system, okay. So, uh, theta stands for um, internal energy, or what we call thermodynamic energy, but also with gravitational and kinetic energy, amounts of energy associated with, uh, with the, this mass flow here, okay? Okay, so uh, when we do this calculation, the first law of thermodynamics, you have heat entering the control volume, okay, here. You have work entering the control volume. You have heat going out and work going out here. So QE stands for entering, WE stands for entering, okay, and QS stands for, this is Portuguese actually, for, for the amount of heat that's going out of the control volume, okay. And this summations here stands for the energy associated with, I don't know, in, uh, in the kth input flow, okay? So we're going to account because, well, I only draw one uh, entering mass flow, but you can have several entering mass flows, okay? So uh, if, if we combine terms here, for instance, I want to, to define the net heat input. So I combine uh, what's entering and subtract what's exiting, okay? I want to calculate, uh, to define the net work going out of the volume, okay? So I combine like this, and this is the net uh, output energy associated with the, with the mass flow. So combining these equations, okay, you have this form of the first law of thermodynamics, okay? We're going to use that in a few moments. Don't worry if you're not used to this uh, law. It's only, I'm going back some slides, it's only an inventory, okay? It's a mathematical formulation of this kind of inventory, okay? So don't bother with mathematical representation of the first first law. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, just writing down uh, according to the definition that we have uh, made here, okay? Uh, so we're going to try to apply that in, in the thermal machines. In, in an important aspect to, to observe here is that our thermal machines have uh, evoluted a lot since the first ones in the 1700s to today. So, so how these very inefficient machines evolved to this uh, very, very efficient machines, which today, as I said, represent uh, or is responsible for 80% of all electrical energy generated in the world, okay? Uh, a typical power plant, we're going to, I don't know if you understood what I'm trying to say. We're going to apply these equations, the first and the second, second law of thermodynamics, to uh, a thermal power plant, okay, in this class. And 
uh, next week we're going to, to see in more details a, a biogas thermopower plant and also a, a biomass thermopower plant. Okay, so in this class I'm simply uh, talking about general power plants like this one in Turkey. Okay, actually it uses coal as fuel. Okay, so when you see a power plant like this, a thermal power plant, you you always uh, you need to always look for the for the energy source for the fuel. In this case, it's coal. Okay, and uh, well, you can see several other um, characteristic aspects of a thermal power plant. You see, for instance, well, as I said, the heat supply to the power plant uh, obtained from burning coal. You also see, uh, as I said, it, it's impossible not to reject some amount of heat. Okay, so you always see a system of heat rejection. So in this case, or, or uh, I'm not sure, it's a, it seems to be uh, cooling towers. Okay, and you also see a uh, connection uh, to the electricity grid or some kind of, uh, of output of the mechanical uh, exergy or electricity, okay? The, the, what we call the surplus exergy, okay? The remaining uh, organized form of energy that we can sell to somebody or we can transform that to uh, kinetic energy in, a, in our cars, for instance, okay? So th this is very typical in all thermal power plants. As I said, heat supply, re uh, heat rejection, and the surplus output, okay? Uh, the important question is, uh, I'm going back one slide, okay? Because I, let's say I want to sell electricity. So in terms of business, I want to produce this electricity by burning the minimal amount of coal possible. I want to, uh, I want to, to, uh, to convert 100% of this heat to electricity. Or, if I already know that this is impossible, I want to convert the maximum amount of it to exergy, to surplus exergy, which means that. I want to minimize the res rejection of heat, okay? So, the important question is, uh, is that, is there a physical limit to the efficiency of the conversion of heat to mechanical work? Is there a mechanical, is there a limit to the, to the conversion of organized, sorry, uh, let me start again. <laughs> is there a physical limit to the efficiency of the conversion of organized, disorganized forms of energy to organized forms of energy. <laughs> I hope I didn't mess your minds up, okay? Uh, and that's an, uh, what I'm trying to show you now, in a few moments. Uh, first, we start by recognizing that uh, the physical laws are symmetrical with respect to the arrow of time. What do I mean by arrow of time? Uh, say, for instance, or consider for a moment a pendulum, as it's shown here. So, you have the pendulum in, well, there's no friction, okay, so it's going to stay forever in this cycle, okay, there's no friction. Uh, and this cycle, you can represent it in this graph here, okay, so you have, uh, in this axis here, you have this the speed, let's say, phi dot, and here the angular position of the pendulum, okay? And the mechanical law that represents the second law of uh, Newton's second law is written here. It's a differential equation. M stands for the mass of the pendulum. K, uh, yeah, K is uh, actually, this is this is not exactly, it's k times sinus of theta, okay? So k, uh, k represents the, 
uh, restitution force, which is gravity, is proportional to gravity, okay, gravity, and D is dissipation, okay, which is zero in this case. But the point is that, uh, let me just erase all this stuff because it's going to be polluted. The point is, what do I do I mean by when I say that the laws are symmetrical? In this in this uh, situation, if we try to to generate this graph here or the movement, the angular position of the pendulum, theta, okay, we can start at t equals zero and start to integrate this equation. Okay, so we start here, and we are able to reproduce this this trajectory here okay if we invert time if we consider that time is flowing backwards it's exactly the same thing the, the movement is not going to to change so if we invert time okay now it's spinning in the counterclockwise sense we're going to start from the right start integrating to the left because time is flowing backwards now and what we see is that our law th this t here this which stands for time is uh, is flowing backwards but the law the the mathematical equation does not change so that's why i say that all physical laws are symmetrical with respect to time yeah? okay uh, except one except the second law of thermodynamics. And this is related to that efficiency that I was talking about, okay? So what is uh, the second law of thermodynamics? First of all, there are several ways of formulating the second law of thermodynamics. I'm gonna give you um, one type of formulation which is not, uh, uh, which is very useful for for conceptual uh, reasoning, but it's not very useful for 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 instance engineering calculations. Okay, but it's very very simple to understand. You just follow me. Okay, so uh, the second law of thermodynamics is related to the spontaneous sense of uh, natural transformations, like the flow of energy. So, in other words, the flow of energy is a kind of uh, transformation. We know that uh, heat flows naturally, spontaneously, from high temperature to low temperature. You don't need to, to do nothing, okay? Uh, this is going to happen without uh, any interference. So, when you have a thermal source at high temperature and that someone to receive this energy, we call that a heat sink, okay? So you can see that there is a natural spontaneous flow of energy, okay? Uh, what we do, when, when we want to convert this flow of thermal energy into some kind of organized form of energy, we, uh, we need to do this. We need to build a, some kind of machine, some kind of uh, thermodynamic cycle like, for instance, this Stirling engine here has a piston, a double-action piston, and have a, a working substance inside, which is uh, air, actually. So this, by this mechanism here and the corresponding working substance inside, I'm representing all, the, all its complexities in this uh, water mill here. So we're going to use this uh, heat flow, which is as I said, spontaneous and natural and so on, we're going to tap some of, uh, some of this energy and we're going to convert that to organized form of energy. Uh, work, uh, like force times displacement or torque times uh, the angular uh, rotation, okay, that we're going to extract from our, uh, our heat flow. Okay? And the point is, what we want to show is that um, is it's impossible not to reject some amount of heat. Okay. Uh, well, as since we need to to do calculations, we have to state some 
some terms here. So the temperature of the heat source is going to be TQ. The temperature of the heat sink, the heat absorber, is going to be TF. Okay. Uh, the amount of, of heat obtained from the heat source is Q. Q okay. And the amount of heat rejected to the environment or to, to the heat absorber is QF. And the surplus exergy, okay, is W, leaking in Portuguese. Sorry, it's have, I, I didn't have time to translate all, all ex, absolutely all uh, of my slides, okay? And uh, the definition of this conversion we're going to define by eta is equal to uh, the surplus exergy divided by the amount of heat that I drain from the heat source. Okay, this is think think in terms of a power plant. This is the electricity injected in the the grid from which we obtain revenues, and this is proportional to the consumption of fuel. Okay, so this is the definition of the the cycle efficiency. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, as I said, uh, W leak is the equivalent to the work performed by, in the past, a certain number of horses. Uh, and that's, that's why we use the word work, because it replaced this mechanical energy, this surplus mechanical energy here in the numerator, replaces a certain amount of work done by horses or men, even men. Okay, so that's why we use the word work okay and uh, that's why we use uh, as as a power unit what we call horsepower okay so this, this comes from this period here uh, and the denominator is proportional as i said to to the cost proportional to the certain amount of coal used in those very ancient uh, watts and new commons and thomas savory's machine okay uh, and uh, as I was explaining, the word work, and uh, especially the unit horsepower, actually uh, is a concept developed by Watt in order to facilitate his sales. Okay, uh, He was a very, very clever guy and a very good scientist, actually. And, uh, well, he wanted to sell his machines to these uh, coal mine coal miners, um, owners. And the problem from the perspective of the, buy, the, the person who's going to buy, what he needs to know is what, what kind of machine or what size of machine do I need to replace, I don't know, 700 horses which I have in my coal mine, okay? So uh, there needed to be a certain type of equivalence between an animal horse and a unit of power. So what developed the concept of horsepower, which is uh, useful in terms of calculating how much horses uh, can be replaced with this machine model, or if I need the, uh, to replace more horses, I, I get a bigger machine model. And also the cost is proportional to the consumption, to the fuel, to the operation cost. Okay, so the search for better efficiency, which, as I said, was very, very poor before what, with uh, Thomas Savory and New Commons machine. Okay, uh, so the, the search for better efficiency uh, is related to the use of fuel, which is related to cost, to, to operating cost. Okay, and also uh, an observation: James Watt became very rich. In addition to being a very, very good technician, he was a very a good salesman, actually. Okay? So as I was saying, the quest for maximum efficiency uh, is motivated by, let's say, by greed. We, you want to produce the biggest amount of, of horsepower, of uh, surplus exergy, with the minimum amount of fuel. Uh, that was, let's say, 
200 years or 150 years ago, but today the, the quest for maximum efficiency is especially motivated by uh, climate changes uh, concerns. Okay, so we want actually what we want to do now is to replace this fossil sources to renewable sources by renewable sources. Okay, we want to re replace that, and and we also want to to burn the least as possible of fuel because this this uh, has consequences, environmental and social, and so that's another good reason for searching for maximum <coughs> conversion efficiency. But the problem is, how do I how do I know uh, if my machine is close to this uh, maximum efficiency or if it's not? Because if it's close to the maximum, to the maximum, to the maximum, to the theoretical maximum, I know that, well, that's nature. I, I cannot do better than that, okay? Uh, but to, to know, to, in order to calculate that, uh, I need to understand how exactly a thermal machine works. Okay, I'm going to explain. Uh, so, taking back our reasoning, uh, that's our thermal machine. Inside here, you have a working substance executing a cycle. This working substance absorbs heat from a heat supply. It rejects heat to, to the environment, let's say, and it produces, it exports some amount of, of uh, exergy. Okay. The heat supply can come from a, a combustion reaction, as we are going to focus on this class, coal, oil, gas, or biomass. So these are all these are all thermal power plants, but you also can have heat from a nuclear reaction or from from the sun. We're going to we are going to have a specific uh, class on this subject. Okay, and in, when we talk about uh, thermal power plants, the heat absorber is always the environment. Okay. It's the atmosphere or some um, body of water, like a river, lake, or sea, but it's always the environment. Okay, and I'm stressing this point because you know you cannot control the temperature of your heat absorber. You cannot control the heat of the atmosphere, for instance, the, the temperature of the atmosphere. But you can control the temperature of your heat supply by controlling, for instance, the combustion temperature. Okay, so if you want to, to produce uh, more heat, uh, sorry, more work with less heat, you need to increase efficiency. So a thermal machine, or looking inside the thermal machine, okay, the working fluid that is ex executing a thermodynamic cycle, it can be something like this, like it, it is shown you. Let's, let's consider, for instance, uh, steam. I have the working substance is steam. Okay, so what do you need to do? You need to to uh, to get cold water to get cold water here. Sorry, <laughs> cold water. It's going to absorb heat from the combustion. So you're going to have the cold water is going to be transformed into uh, hot steam. So you have a phase change in between, okay? So if I have a cold liquid, which is heated in your heat supplier, in this case a boiler, okay? And then you extract that in a turbine, and then you can reject the amount of heat that has to be rejected in, in a cooling tower, for instance, okay? So in this case, you have a pump in order to increase pressure, in the pump, you increase pressure, but not the temperature. So you have cold water here at high pressure. Okay. In in three, you have high pressure water and also high temperature water that is uh, that has has been transformed to to steam. Okay. Uh, after the turbine, you have low pressure water still possibly in the form of steam or a mixture of steam and liquid. So low pressure, but still high temperature. 
okay so in order to cool down this low pressure water high temperature water you have to reject some amount of heat here okay and that's related to the maximum efficiency just to, to show you some uh, some of these uh, equipments here are some sugarcane boilers actually these are two sugarcane boilers from uh, from uh, Bevap sugar mill in Minas Gerais okay near near Nova Brasilândia de Minas which is in the northwestern part of Minas Gerais actually there, there are two boilers you have a um, one of the conveyor belts feeding uh, sugarcane baguettes here here is the the furnace and all this is the equipment for for removing particles and so on in order to to retain all that you cannot emit to the atmosphere. Okay, um, the turbine is is like a, you can think of it in when you uh, if you do, if you're not used with this kind of equipment, you can think of a, in terms of a, a windmill. So a turbine is a kind of a windmill for steam. Okay, so it's going to remove some of the kinetic energy of the steam but also some of the thermal energy of the steam, okay? Uh, a windmill only removes the kinetic energy of the wind. So it's a kind of a, a windmill for, for steam. Uh, the element that rejects heat to the environment can be cooling towers, as in this power plant. So you have hot water in contact with, with, the, with the atmosphere. So it's going to reject heat. It's, it's also going to evaporate. So what this smoke that you see here is not smoke, it's, it's steam, OK? Um, uh, and uh, well, so those are the, the main elements. And the, the pumps are very small pieces of equipment, so it's not worthwhile showing it to you. OK, so let me state, let me elaborate on the second law of thermodynamics. I'm going to present you uh, what we call the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics and also the Kelvin Planck's statement of the second law of thermodynamics. These formulations of the second law actually says uh, what is possible and what is impossible. So that's very interesting because it's not uh, quantitatively that you, you're going to use this formulation of the second law, but it's very rich in, ter in terms of interpretation. Okay, so let's see Clausius' statement of the second law of th thermodynamics. What he says is that heat flowing from a low temperature reservoir to a high temperature reservoir it's not possible to obtain this flow without the expense of some amount of work, some amount of exergy. This means that heat's not going to flow from a low temperature environment to a high temperature environment spontaneously. You have to force that some way, by, by some means, okay? It's exactly uh, what possibly my, my air conditioning here is not working, <laughs> so it's very hot inside, but I suppose you are very comfortable in, in rooms uh, with good air conditioning systems. So your air conditioning is uh, pumping heat from, from your rooms, wherever you are, and reject, uh, at low temperature. Let's say that you are at, uh, I don't know, 25 degrees. Okay, so the air conditioning is absorbing heat uh, from 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 the rooms, okay, and uh, is rejecting this amount of energy to the environment, to the external environment, which is at a higher temperature, uh, let's say 30 degrees. Here in São Carlos now, uh, around 30 degrees, okay. So what, he, what Clausius says is this is not spontaneous, so it's impossible to obtain that without the expense of some work, okay? 
so as I said, if you want to, to produce this flow from a low temperature to a high temperature sink, you are going to have to expend some amount of work. Okay? That's exactly what happens in, is, uh, with your air conditioning equipment. Uh, let's see, this is more or less natural for all of us because we have experience with this kind of stuff, okay? So this does not surprise anybody. Usually it does not surprise anybody, okay? The other formulation of the second law is less intuitive, okay? So, but it's completely equivalent. I'm going to prove you that, okay? So what says the Kelvin Planck's formulation of the second law of thermodynamics. Well, it says that it is possible to have, uh, to obtain work from uh, heat flowing from a high temperature reservoir to a low temperature reservoir. So it says that it is possible. This is natural. This is okay. This does not violate any, any physical law. But it says that this is impossible. Okay, it is impossible to convert 100% of, of the heat absorbed from the heat source to work. You have to reject some amount of heat here. Okay, it's impossible to have zero rejection down here. Okay, so let's see. And this is uh, a lot less intuitive. Uh, many times I, I teach that in undergraduate course. When I show this and ask to the students, do you think this is natural? They ask themselves, why? Why this is not possible? Okay, it should be possible. Okay, the, it should be possible, but I'm going to show you it's only wishful thinking. Okay, so let's. Uh, I'm going to prove you that if if we accept one of the statements of the second law, the other statement will result from this, this, this exception, okay? Uh, so let's see. Uh, let's suppose that this is possible, okay? Let's suppose that uh, Kelvin Planck is wrong, they are wrong, and this is actually possible. So this is our working hypothesis, okay? If this is possible, uh, to have a machine that produces work only by absorbing heat without rejecting heat. Okay, if this is possible, I can use this surplus exergy to drive uh, a thermal machine like this. So I'm going to use this surplus to drive an air conditioning system. Okay? So I don't have to... <clears throat> To get electricity from from the, the the plug, okay, I use the exergy from this possible by hypothesis machine, okay. Okay, so if we assemble both machines in in a in a single machine, if we consider a single machine, what we see is that we have a net uh, a net effect which we know is not possible. Uh, the net effect is heat flowing from the low temperature reservoir to the high temperature reservoir because the work produced cancels uh, the work consumed by, by my air conditioning system. Okay? So I have a net effect of heat flowing from the low temperature reservoir to the high temperature reservoir. Okay, and we know this is not possible. Okay, so by assuming that Planck's machine is possible, by assuming that Planck's impossible machine is possible, we get an absurdity. Okay, so this is a proof by reducing to an absurdity. So that means that our hypothesis is wrong and this is impossible. Okay. I hope you, you managed to fall. So let's come back to the problem of uh, searching for maximum conversion efficiencies. Okay, And this is related uh, to 
the Battle of Waterloo or the Napoleonic Wars, okay, uh, in particularly the Battle of Waterloo, uh, where the Duke of Wellington defeated Napoleon, okay, in 1815. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned that uh, Sadi Carnot was a, a cadet at the military school, and Carnot was a very clever guy, actually, and he um, recognized that uh, one of the main reasons for the British victory was that, uh, well, their guns were better, their cannons were better, or in the whole, their industry was better. So Carnot decided to to um, to try to defeat the British in the future, in a foreseeable future, by developing better machines. Okay, so that's really what motivated Carnot. Okay, and he tried to to quantify and to state, um, to, to quantify the second law of thermodynamics, to state, to, to formulate uh, means of calculating this maximum conversion efficiency, okay? Because uh, from the two statements, from uh, Kelvin Planck's and, uh, Car and uh, Clausius statements, uh, we know that we have to reject some amount of heat. So we know that, uh, let me draw something here, we know that um, my efficiency, which is equal to W divided by the amount of heat absorbed from the heat source, and uh, I don't know if you remember what is what, Q, F, and W, and uh, by applying the first law of thermodynamics, okay, I can write this as, okay, so here you, you have Q, Q minus Q, F divided by Q, Q, okay, and finally you have Q, F divided by Q, Q, okay. So if Q, F is always greater than zero here, that means that your efficiency will be always uh, smaller than one. Sorry, not smaller or e equal. That's my eraser. So it's going to be always smaller than one. We know that. That's a consequence of uh, Kelvin Planck's and Clausius' postulates of the uh, second law of thermodynamics. But we need to calculate what is the maximum efficiency. The efficiency is always less or equal to the maximum efficiency, which is always less than one, okay? How do I calculate this? That's what Carnot was trying to solve, okay? So let's go back to Carnot, Leonard Sadi Carnot. Okay, and what he did, he, he thought about our thermal machine, as I was, uh, as I was showing you, okay? And he started by recognizing that you have the system, which is the, the working substance inside the machine, the air inside the piston, he, inside here, okay? Uh, you also have the environment, okay? What is, what is not the thermal substance is the environment, okay? And he recognized that when you invert the sense of the machine, I don't know if you, if you were able to, to recognize that I have a, a thermal machine which exports exergy, but I also can have a kind of an air conditioning which imports exergy, okay? We can, we can, uh, call that uh, heat, heat pump, for instance, okay? And he recognized that the maximum efficiency, okay, occurs when the thermal machine is reversible, okay? So let me go back a few slides. He was thinking about inverting the sense of the machine, okay? 
I have a thermal machine here. If I invert the sense, I have a thermal pump here, okay? And his thought was that if by inverting the sense, the working sense of the machine, uh, the effect is nil, nothing. This is a machine ha that has a maximum efficient. Th this is the actual text inside Carnot's uh, book, uh, okay, by uh, working in the, as he says, the sens inverse, le résultat ne serait alors que la consommation d'un travail égal à celui produit par le fonctionnement en sens direct. Okay. Uh, so the maximum efficiency occurs when the machine is reversible. Uh, as he says in French, when you invert the sense of the machine, you have exactly the same thing. Okay, I'm going to show you that. So, what what is uh, what is what we we call strict reversibility? Okay, so let's start with a thermal machine. I have two two units of heat energy being drawn from the thermal reservoir. Okay, these two units of thermal energy are converted to one unit of work and I have to reject one unit of heat down here, okay? Okay, so if I consider if this is machine is reversible and I invert the sense of the machine, everything happens exactly the same but in the opposite sense. I mean, this machine here on the left rejects one unit of work. The machine on the right absorbs one unit of work. Okay? This one produces one unit of work. This one consumes one unit of work. And both exchange two units of heat with the high temperature thermal reservoir. Okay? So when we when the machine is reversible when we invert the sense, all these quantities can be maintained exactly as they are. So when we combine the machines, they, now, when we use the thermal machine to drive the, the air conditioning, the, the heat pump, okay, all, you, you, all fluxes of heat and work cancel out. Okay? So the effect is you have nothing. Okay, because they are all being cancelled. So when this is possible, when this happens, okay, you have a reversible machine which has maximum conversion efficiency. Okay, so that's the conclusion of, of uh, Carnot. Okay, so uh, summarizing a little bit his, his conclusion, the, as I said, the maximum, maximum efficiency is always less than one for a temperature difference which is uh, finite, okay? Also, he showed that uh, um, all, let's, let's take this one, all reversible machines have the same efficiency. You can have different reversible machines. This is a Stirling machine which happens to have, uh, which happens to be reversible, theoretically reversible. Uh, Carnot's machine, which I'm going to show in, uh, in the next line, is also reversible, so they are very different machines, but they have exactly the same theoretical efficiency, okay, conversion efficiency. He also showed that all non-reversible machines have smaller efficiencies, so all uh, irreversible machines are less efficient than any reversible machine. And he also proposed a means of calculating the maximum efficiency, which is the efficiency of the reversible machine. Okay, this formula actually was uh, originally proposed by Carnot, not not this, not in this way. Something like this. Uh, let me use this 
this area here. Uh, one, the maximum efficiency you calculate as uh, a, a certain function of the temperature of the cold reservoir divided by a function of the temperature of the hot reservoir. Okay, you know. Uh, this function f is a generic function, and actually, the the what we what we call the absolute temperature scale. Absolute temperature scale. Scale, uh, like Kelvin or Rankine. Kelvin is associated with uh, centigrades, and Rankine is associated with Fahrenheit. Okay. This uh, special absolute temperature scales were constructed so that this function is uh, unitary. Okay, so let me just erase in order to to clean my slide. Okay, so if you construct a specific temperature scale, you can calculate your maximum efficiencies. Okay, and uh, an important observation here is that uh, when we think about a thermal power plant, the lower temperature reservoir is always the environment. So, as Tf is always the environment temperature, okay, and the hot reservoir has a temperature. Which is uh, which is controllable because I can control, for instance, the combustion temperature of of, uh, of my biomass, for instance. Okay. And in, just to to write down a working equation, which we're going to need in a few slides, by recognizing that the hot temperature is equals to the ambient temperature plus a certain step. Okay, we can replace that and write uh, write down the maximum efficiency obtained by a thermal machine. Okay, like this, and we um, immediately recognize that by increasing delta t. Okay, if I make delta t bigger and bigger and bigger equals infinity, for instance. Okay going to infinity, okay? I see that this term here goes to, to, to zero. Huh? This term here go, goes to zero. And my reversible machine is going to be 100% efficient, okay? But, you know, this is not practical because, well, you're, you're never going to attain that. But before, uh, before that, you don't have... Uh, materials that will resist very, very high temperatures, okay? So you have practical, in addition to theoretical problems, you also have practical problems, okay? Uh, so also Carnot proposed a thermal machine that is reversible, okay? I, I showed you the Stirling machine, which came uh, a lot uh, um, later, okay, proposed by Stirling, but at that time he proposed a thermal machine which is not practical, but is, uh, which, is, which is not applicable in practical applications, but it, uh, it represents a very good uh, reference for us, for our studies, for our comparisons, okay? So let's see what is the Carnot's pump uh, thermal machine, okay? So he proposed a reversible thermal machine executing this cycle. First, you have the working fluid here, okay, uh, executing these uh, four transformations, okay. So you're going to, let's start by, by here. You're going to absorb heat from the boiler here, okay. So my, my working substance is going to absorb heat from the, the boiler or from the heat source at constant temperature, okay? So if I make a graph like here, a graph of temperature in terms of entropy or pressure or volume, 
Uh, I can use any pair of, of properties. There's no problem. Uh, but if I use uh, temperature and entropy, okay, so the the, the heat absorb, absorption part is isothermal, okay? And the heat rejection part of the cycle is also isothermal. So my working substance is going to reject heat to the, the heat absorber at constant temperature. Okay, so you have two horizontal segments. And between the low pressure and the high pressure, you have different, sorry, uh, between low temperature and high temperature, you have to change pressure levels also, okay? So you have a pump here, you have isentropic compression in a pump, and uh, you produce work in a turbine, isentropic expansion in the turbine. If you're not uh, used with these terms, well, isothermal, I think everybody is familiar with the term, is constant temperature. Isentropic means that uh, there is no, means two things. There is no heat exchange. So when you compress the, the working fluid in the pump, okay, you increase pressure, but you do not exchange heat with the environment. So there is no heat loss, neither heat gain from the environment. In this operation, compression, and also in the, the expansion in the turbine. And it also means that it's no, there is no friction, there is no any kind of irreversibility in these uh, transitions, in these transformations. Okay, so the name is, is, may seem complicated, but the term may seem complicated, but it's actually very simple, okay? Practical problems associated with the Carnot cycle, because as I said, it's a, it's a reversible machine, um, but it's not practical. It's very good for, for our analysis, but it's not practical. I want to, to discuss a little bit this, because it, it's, it leads to the the actual practical cycles that we're going to use, okay? <coughs> so if you consider, for instance, water as our working fluid, uh, you know, maintaining a, a temperature constant with gases is impractical. Every time that you absorb heat, uh, if you have a certain amount of gas, it's going to, to absorb heat, it's going to change temperature. You cannot uh, it, why it's going to change temperature? Because the mean velocity of the particles of the gas is, go, is going to increase. Okay, so it's it's impossible to maintain the temperature constant for gases. So this, uh, if you have a gas, your temperature is always going to increase. So the, the same temperature entropy, temperature entropy here for a gas when you absorb heat, when the gas absorbs heat, it's going to increase the temperature, okay? It's impossible. So if you want to maintain the temperature constant, you can use a fluid that is changing phase, okay? Water, when it absorbs heat and uh, changes to steam, the temperature is uh, constant. So you solve this with, uh, with a changing phase fluid, like represented here, uh, okay, here is the liquid portion, here is the vapor portion, okay, and so with water, you're able, sorry, to absorb heat at constant temperature, okay, no problem. The same thing when you reject heat, you reject heat, uh, okay, so you're re rejecting heat to the environment, and the temperature is kept constant. The problem here is related to erosion of the turbine blades. Uh, okay, so why, why this is so? Because here you have, in this point, you have a mixture of liquid and vapor. Liquid droplets. Okay, these droplets will impact on uh, the surfaces of the blades and at very high velocities such as 
150 meters per second, okay, or something like this, like this, 80 meters per second, and it will erode these blades. Okay, so this is a very important practical problem, and also pumping a, a, a mixture of gas and liquid is a very uh, low efficient operation, also due to practical practical problems. Okay, so the end of the story is that the Carnot cycle executed like I, I'm showing you here is not practical. You could implement Carnot cycle like this, okay? So you solve the problem of pumping uh, a multi-phase flow or blade erosion. Yeah? Here you have only steam, and here you have only liquid. The problem with this implementation of the Carnot cycle is to have very, very high pressures here, something like uh, 10 to the 5 bar. You know that 4,000 bar, let me just uh, make a, a drawing here for you, for you to have an idea of how much high is 10 to the 5 bar. If you have, a, let's say, a steel plate, like, I don't know, one centimeter here, one centimeter, and you have a jet water, okay, water at, uh, let's say, 4,000 bar, 4,000 bar. It cuts the, it cut, it's able, this uh, water jet is a, a capable of cutting this steel plate, okay? Actually, this is one way of cutting metals if it's with uh, uh, very high pressure water jets, okay? So 10 to the 5 bar is really an impossible pressure, so it's not practical for this reason. Let me just control my, my the amount of time that I have. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, so if we cannot do, if we cannot implement the Carnot cycle, what can we do? Well, we're going to do what is possible to be done. And what is possible to be done, if the pressure is too high here, if the pressure is too high here, I'm not going to allow this pressure to increase to that level, okay? So, instead of uh, limiting the top part of the cycle by the temperature, as in the Carnot cycle, I'm going to limit it by the maximum allowable pressure in the system, okay? So, the limiting part of the cycle is the maximum allowable pressure, which is related to the to the to the uh, width of the tubes the pipes okay it's related to to my engineering parameters okay so this is what we call the Rankine cycle okay it's the lower part is equal to a, to a kernel cycle but the upper part is uh, actually executed at a constant Pressure, okay, so the transformations of the Rankine cycle, which is not reversible, by the way, okay, so the transformations are almost the same. Uh, isentropic compression here in the pump, no isentropic meaning no heat exchange, and no friction and any other kind of irreversibilities, okay, so isentropic compression. Instead of isothermal heating, we have isobaric heating. Isobaric means constant pressure, okay? So the fluid, the working fluid is absorbing heat at constant pressure, isop, okay? Isentropic expansion at the turbine, that's exactly the same as in the Carnot cycle, and isothermal cooling at the condenser, okay? This is ex exactly the same as in the Carnot cycle. So the Rankine cycle is a very, the closest that we can get to the Carnot cycle in, because of these practical limitations that I mentioned before, okay? So let's see some applications, okay? Uh, I want to be able to, calc to make some calculations with you 
And actually, we're going to compare the best way of, uh, let's say, exploiting, to, to transforming, to getting XRG from a thermal source uh, by comparing three types of cycle, okay? Actually, four, because we always have the Carnot cycle, okay? So, first, we're going to analyze a steam cycle, then a gas cycle, then a combined gas steam cycles, okay? We're going to to make these calculations. Uh, first, the scenario, you, you know, this, this uh, table is very interesting because it shows the thermal efficiency of uh, uh, old and new and future power plants, what is uh, expected to happen for many different states, okay? So, the thermal efficiency obtained in these power plants. You see that uh, uh, almost 20 years ago, the average efficiency was around, uh, let's say, 30, 32, 35 percent, something like that, okay? So as the time passes, this efficiency is increased, and what's, um, what's estimated for 2,100 is something around 50 percent, okay? And uh, this is just to show you that this is due to the use of combined gas uh, gas steam plants. Okay, uh, these these plants, thirty percent uh, or something like that, is is the usual efficiency of a Rankine or which is for steam, but also the the average efficiency that you get in a gas cycle, a Brighton cycle. It's, it's named Brighton cycle. Okay. And by uh, using combined cycles, we get higher efficiencies, uh, around 60-something, okay? And I'm going to show you that these efficiencies are very close at, to the maximum theoretical efficiency, okay? This is uh, just to keep in mind these this numbers, because we're going to, to compare these uh, or power plants or uh, virtual power plants to these numbers here, to these figures here. So, so uh, let's start by a uh, combined gas steam power plant. Well, let me see. Yeah. I'm going to, to, to explain the cycle here. Then I'm, I'll show the picture here. Okay. So a combined gas steam cycle whose efficiency we're going to calculate is around 60%. Okay, it combines a gas cycle with a steam cycle. So let's follow the, the working fluids. You start by, uh, by burning some fuel, but by getting heat from some heat source, by burning gas, bio, bio, uh, biogas or gasification products, for instance. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so you burn... You, you burn um, you, you get heat from some source, and you heat air. Let's consider that we have air here, okay? Just to simplify our calculations. So you first you compress air, so you have high pressure. You have high pressure here. Sorry, high pressure here, but still low temperature. Okay, then you absorb heat. In the combustion chamber, and you have, you still have high pressure because the absorption is at constant pressure, and here you have high temperature, high pressure, high temperature. Okay, so this is the maximum amount of energy that your fluid, your working fluid, is carrying. Then you expand the gas in the turbine. You get mechanical work in the shaft here. Okay, the shaft. Let me just draw one thing here. The shaft is the same for everybody here, okay? So you produce mechanical work, which is in the shaft here, okay? And so at this point here, you have <clears throat> low pressure because your gas expanded in the turbine, but you still have high temperatures, not as high as at the exit of the combustion chamber, but still very high, something around uh, 400 or 
300 degrees. It still carries a lot of thermal energy. Okay, so instead of rejecting that to the atmosphere, to the flue gases, for instance, you can uh, use the heat carried by these combustion products, okay, to as a heat source for a steam cycle, as it is shown here. Okay, so you pass these uh, combustion gases through uh, what we call a regenerative boiler. And these gases are going to, to supply heat to the steam, and they are going to become uh, cooler at the exit here. Okay, so you have hot gases, cool gases, then you can reject that to the atmosphere. Yeah? These gases, they are still hot, not as hot as as here and not as hot as here, but still hotter than the, the absorbed air at the entrance here, okay? Okay, so let's follow the steam cycle. You have uh, cold water here, cold liquid water, then you compress, so you have cold liquid water at high pressure, then you absorb heat from the combustion gases, uh, and you have here high pressure, high temperature water in the form of superheated steam. Okay, then you expand in a turbine. You produce work. Okay, then here you have hot water at low pressure. Then you reject heat to the environment, and then this completes the cycle. Okay. So in the, well, you, you have the pump consuming energy, you have the compressor, which also consumes energy. The net surplus here is used to drive a generator, which produces the electricity, which you put in the grid in order to obtain your, your money, your revenues. Okay, so this is a combined gas steam. Uh, this is the diagram, and this is what actually it seems, you have, for instance, gas arriving here. Okay, this is the combustion chamber. You have hot gases here. This, this is the, the turbine. You have uh, low pressure, uh, still hot gases. This is the regenerative boiler, which produces steam. Steam is driving the steam turbine here. Huh? Okay and the cooling towers back there, okay? So you always have this same type of, of, of equipment in all power plants, okay? Okay? Professor, no, I have a question about what, what the temperature of uh, superheated steam? Yeah, we're going to calculate that in a few moments, okay? okay? But typic typically here, superheated steam, 300 degrees, 400 degrees. Okay, we're going to calculate that in a few moments. Okay, uh, so our machine, uh, what we're going to do to compare all the possibilities is to compare different types of implementations. Okay, so we're going to state, uh, let, let, let's say, a benchmark problem. We have a heat source at a certain temperature. We also have a heat sink at a fixed temperature. So TQ and T, TF are, are fixed, okay? And what we can do in order to increase efficiency, if we want to increase efficiency, since we cannot decrease the environment temperature, we must try to always increase the, the, the temperature of the heat source, okay? Oh, sorry, sorry for the Portuguese. So the, the, the ambient temperature, we cannot control that. And the higher temperature, the temperature of the heat source cannot be increased to infinity because you have material limitations or practical limitations. Not only material, for instance, uh, if you increase too much the temperature here at this point, because as I, as I showed, you have interest in increasing the temperature here in order to have 
higher efficiencies. But if you have uh, temperatures, let's say 2000 degrees here, the nitrogen present in the air is going to start to react and you're going to, uh, to obtain uh, nitrogen oxides, which will be exhausted here, which in nitrogen oxides in OX are very, very dangerous pollutants. Okay, so you, you cannot emit that in significant amounts. Okay, so the higher temperature is limited due to several reasons. Material resistance, uh, concerns about pollution and so on. Okay, so what we're going to do, or, or in other words, our benchmark problem is going to be something like, like that. We have uh, a heat source at 1000 degrees and our environment at 25. The problem is, what can I do in order to build a machine with the maximum possible efficiency? Of course, if I, if I uh, build a Carnot machine or a Stirling machine, like this one, the efficiency can be calculated like this. So if I could build a Carnot machine, okay, um, the efficiency could be calculated. Uh, one, the temperature minus the temperature of the lower temperature reservoir divided by the higher temperature reservoir by the temperature of the higher temperature reservoir, okay, in, in the absolute scale. So uh, 25 plus 273 is to transform Celsius to Kelvin degrees, okay, and when we, when we do all the calculations, we obtain 76.6%. And this is the maximum possible thermodynamic efficiency, okay. So we know that this is the maximum that we can get from these two temperatures here. Okay, so we're going to make uh, different implementations, a Rankine, a bright cycle, a combined cycle, and we're going to make all the calculations. Okay, let's first start by a uh, Rankine cycle. Okay, uh, as I showed you, uh, this is the temperature entropy graph for, for water. We're, we're studying the Rankine cycle. As, as the temperature for the, um, for the superheated steam is too much for a Rankine cycle, okay? But uh, just in order to, to, to be coherent, in order to, to be able to compare all these implementations, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that we, we are going to build this machine, okay? So, uh, we start at 25. The pressure is atmospheric pressure, okay? We start by compressing isentropically to, I'm going to fix the pressure here to a certain pressure. I'm not sure which, where's the pressure here. Well, some, it's going to be somewhere because I'm going to show you the calculations. So you compress from 25, from, from one bar to the working pressure at the boiler, okay? Then we absorb heat to to 1000 degrees okay uh, as oh, I have an observation this is too much for a Rankine cycle in practice this is smaller than 600 or 500 degrees okay then we expand that in uh, in um, in the turbine okay and we're going to obtain a mixture of actually I don't have the calculation here, but well, uh, we we're going to assume that we can have a mixture of water, liquid water droplets and steam. But if you have very 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 small droplets, uh, you this is not going to be a problem for your turbine blades, okay? And this is good for for the thermodynamic efficiency. So we're going to allow a certain amount of of uh, liquid droplets. But we're going to observe, we're going to verify that uh, this is higher than 90%. I mean, we have 90, more than 90% of steam, okay? Well, this is the uh, qualitative representation of the cycle, okay? And we're going to do the calculations, okay? This is the actual Rankine cycle, okay? 
uh, yeah, I, I fixed 100 bar, okay? And you see that uh, it's very disproportional, okay? It, 1,000 degrees is too high. Uh, before moving further, let me just talk about uh, these, these, uh, these calculations, the, this tool that I'm using, because we're going to do the actual thermodynamic calculations. So in order to obtain all thermodynamic properties of your working substance, you have to have uh, uh, in the past, the, the thermodynamic tables in paper, I mean, usually in the, the, the end of the books, the thermodynamic books, you have these tables, but you have electronic versions already. So I use this software called RevProp. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you it in a few moments. Uh, RevProp, the interesting, what I like about RevProp is you have a student version that you can download and s install in your computer. It's very, very useful. Uh, and RevProp, you can use, uh, I have it here. I'm going to show you. Yeah. So you can use as a standalone uh, software, but you can also incorporate in, in, an, in an Excel spreadsheet or in a LabVIEW application or in C++ or in Fortran. Uh, you can link with a MATLAB application and so on. So in this uh, class, I'm using it as a standalone software. You can do a lot of stuff with it. You can uh, plot diagrams, for instance, the temperature entropy diagram for, for water. Okay, uh, you can do a lot of things. So when you use uh, uh, one kind of software like this, the first thing is you choose your substance. So let's say uh, pure fluids. You have a lot of different fluids that, that can work as a working fluid. So we're going to use water, OK? And we, what we do, we, for instance, I, come, I want to know what is the enthalpy and the entropy of water at 1 bar, 25 degrees. Enter. So you have entropy, enthalpy, and many other thermodynamic properties. Uh, I'm not showing you all. You can, uh, you can set properties, for instance. Properties, you can choose internal energy, uh, exergy, I'm not finding exergy, flow exergy, and so on. You can have uh, viscosity, for instance, okay? And if you calculate specified point, 25 degrees, one bar, you have everything that you need. Internal energy, enthalpy, entropy, viscosity, and flow exergy, for instance. Okay, I'm going to, I'm not going to, uh, I'm just showing how I did the, the calculation, how I obtained the thermodynamic properties. is very easy. As I said, you can use uh, any of these softwares. Uh, you, you also have uh, free apps for your cell phone. I use one called, uh, what is it called? I don't remember. It's called Steam Properties. It's, it's uh, free for downloading. Okay. And so you have, I don't know how many, but uh, a very large number of possibilities. Okay. So going back to, to my slides, where they are here. Okay. So as I said, I used RevProp in order to obtain all thermodynamic properties of all points. The, the, the actual thermodynamic cycle in the temperature entropy diagram is shown here in red, just for you to have the idea of how much 1,000 1, uh, degrees is in terms of uh, inappropriateness uh, for a Rankine cycle. And also, another important observation is the compressed liquid part. I'm going back one slide. Uh, usually, when I do these drawings, I uh, distort the, the li compressed liquid part in order to, to sh be able to show the transformation. What actually happens is that all the lines here are collapsed or more or less collapsed. So you cannot manage to see the points. Okay. So the, the transformation is here from one to two, but they are 
in this scale indistinguishable, then you absorb heat, expansion in a turbine, and in this case, you're not, you're, you still have superheated steam. Okay, then uh, follow me by by entering all the data that we have, 25 one bar. Okay, I obtain the enthalpy and also the entropy. Point two is 300. Uh, oh, I, I I wrote 300 bar, but well, <laughs> it's not 300. Uh, I wrote 300 bar and the same entropy here. Okay, but if you, if you wish, we can do here. Okay, let's let's do it together. This is a kind of tutorial class. Okay, so I'm going to calculate specified state points. Okay. So my point one, if you remember, is 25 degrees, one bar, okay? And I got the enthalpy, which I'm gonna need for the calculations, and also the entropy. Point two is at the working pressure, which can be 120 bar or 300 bar. Let's say that uh, I'm gonna use 300 bar here. So that's the pressure. And the transformation, I don't know if you remember, so we are at the working pressure, 300 bar, and at the same entropy. Okay, this, this transformation is isentropic. So we are at 300 bar, and the entropy is the same. So I write 0 0.36720. Enter, and you have all other properties. Okay, then we go up to uh, 300 bar. 1,000 degrees, 1,000 degrees, okay, I got the enthalpy and I got the entropy, then we expand that in the turbine, one bar, and the expansion is isentropic, so the entropy remains the same, 2.2880, enter, okay, so we have all our properties. Okay. Is the enthalpies. What we need is uh, are the enthalpies here. Okay, I'm going to show you that. So, do, does someone have uh, any doubts about this? Because that's the only way, way uh, only occasion where I'm going to show you this. Okay, the other calculation, I'm ju just going to show you the results. I'm not going to show you how you can calculate this. Okay. So, uh, sorry. No, we're not present. So uh, here are all uh, all calculations. Uh, oh yeah, I, I made some calculations, 300 bar, to show you uh, an important uh, thing is that my temperature here is limited to 1,000 degrees. So I'm not going beyond this blue line here. I'm not going above this blue line. But if I increase the pressure, I know, because I already did the calculations, that, that my uh, cycle is going to be more efficient. So if I increase the pressure, if I move this point three to the left, I have higher and higher pressures, as I, I did 300 bar here. And we're going to end up, for instance, here. Oh, sorry. So what we have here, you don't have a phase change because here in this region you have boiling water actually uh, above a certain pressure. Above this critical pressure here, you don't have you don't have a phase change. You have supercritical fluid. Okay, remember that I was talking about supercritical CO2. That's the, exactly the same thing only that the pressures are lower and the temperatures are lower and the advantage is uh, to have a better efficiency okay so a supercritical fluid as i showed you is a fluid for which the density of the gaseous phase is equal to the density of the liquid phase okay so you start with uh, uh, below the, the critical isobar, okay, 
you have liquid and gas, and they have very different densities. And when we, when you increase the pressure, the the densities become closer and closer, gets closer and closer. Then you you when they become equal, okay, you have a mixture uh, like an emulsion of liquid and gas. Okay, so that would be a supercritical boiler, and this is. Uh, the, the more advanced power plants are starting to use supercritical cycles or transcritical cycles also. Okay, so this is a, um, a tendency that you can observe that that, contri that contributes to the increase in the efficiency, as I showed in, in the in the beginning of the in that table. Okay, okay, so let's do the calculation. Let's apply the first law of thermodynamics because now we got all enthalpies let's apply the first law and calculate the efficiency of this cycle okay 100 bar let's calculate that so what we're, what we're going to do we need to calculate these quantities the amount of work and heat exchange okay so we start by i'm going to do this very step by step Okay, in order for you to follow, and then the next uh, implementations of the power cycle, I'm going to be uh, to move a lot faster. Okay, because in principle you got all the the more important ideas. Okay, so we start from the data that, that we got. We got all the enthalpies, enthalpy of 0 0.1, 2, 3, and 4, and we're going to apply the first law of thermodynamics for an open system. Remember, I explained to you what, what's an open system. Okay, so we're going to start by defining the, the control volume around the turbine, confining the turbine, and we apply the first law for this control volume. So uh, we know that uh, the amount of heat is zero because it's isentropic. There's no heat, heat exchange uh, between the system and the environment. It is isentropic, but there is work, okay? So if we apply the first law, we get that uh, the work W34 equals to the, to, do, to the entropy change, to the enthalpy change, sorry, okay? So we have this in terms of uh, specific numbers, H3 and H4. H3 is here, H4 is here, and the next thing is we do that for other systems. So we do that for the pump, the same for the pump. We put our control volume here, we apply the first law, and we get that the work absorbed is delta H. It's always delta H, okay? And for the last, we put the control volume around the boiler, apply the first law. Here, there is no work, the work is zero, but the heat absorbed is not zero, then you get the heat absorbed in, in specific terms is delta H, okay, the same thing. So what we have to do now, we calculate with this data here, H1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, and we get these numbers, okay. The negative sign here means that work is being absorbed by the by the machine okay positive means uh, that is being exported by the machine okay the same thing for the boiler the convention is that heat absorbed is positive heat rejected is negative okay when we substitute these into the the formula for for the efficiency we get these numbers and we get 42.5 percent okay okay so that's the efficiency of our Rankine cycle we're going to do that for different types of, of cycle in the same uh, same reservoirs heat and hot reservoirs so now let's try to use only air we here we use only water here we're going to use only air and we're going to do exactly the same. The difference, it's called a Brighton cycle 
but it's exactly the transformations are the, exactly the same as of the Rankine cycle, except that there is no phase change because air at these temperatures does not change phase. Okay, so you have a isentropic compression to the working pressure. Okay, P max is the working pressure. Uh, you had have uh, heat absorption at constant pressure. Okay, then isentropic expansion to the the lower pressure level, which is the atmosphere. Okay, in that we're going to do between 25 and 100 degrees. Okay, Go, well this is one possible implementation. Uh, so we're going to do exactly the same as we did. This is the, the machine, okay? The compressor, we get air, we compress, then we absorb heat. So here you have high pressure, high temperature air, expansion in the turbine, okay? And then exhaustion. And the atmosphere is recycling your hot gases, is absorbing the heat carried by the hot gases here so that you have cold gases in the aspiration here, okay? Well, it's exactly the same démarche, okay? So we, for the last time, we go to our uh, thermodynamic proper calculator. We choose the substance. Uh, air is a pseudo fluid, pseudo pure fluid, okay? And we calculate this, the point. So 25 degrees, one bar, okay? Uh, then uh, the working pressure can be 20 bar, the same entropy, and so on and so forth. Okay, 3.8843, and etc. etc. Okay, the same thing. So I did that for for air, and got these uh, these entropies, H1, H2, H3, and H4. Okay. Uh, I don't remember, somebody asked me about the temperature here. In this case, we got 300 degrees, 303 in 3 degrees. Okay, so you see that it's not as hot as 1,000 degrees, but it's still very hot. Okay, so it carries a lot of energy that is being rejected to the atmosphere. Okay, so the idea of combining a gas with a steam cycle is is to somehow recover a certain amount of this energy here, okay? So let's complete the calculations for the Brighton cycle. It's the same story. We put control volumes in the compressor, combustion, and turbine. We calculate the, the works, the, the turbine work, the, the compressor work, and the, the absorbed heat and we replace in the calculation formula and we get 56.18%. And this efficiency we are com we must compare with Rankini Rankini that we have just obtained 42.5 it's it's better but it's still uh, significantly below the Carnot's efficiency 76.6. Okay? Okay. So uh, now, uh, yeah, this is just to show you the, the actual Brighton cycle. Uh, and you see that the temperature is very, very high. And you can observe that because you don't see that in a thermal power plant. But you can observe that in, in jet planes. Uh, it's very hot here, the, the gas combustion. Okay, now, the, the, what we're going to do now, we're going to analyze a combined cycle. We're going to combine, we're going to try to recover some of this uh, thermal, thermal energy uh, using it to drive a Rankine cycle. Okay, so the idea is to combine, as I said, a gas cycle, the, the hot gases uh, at the exhaust of the turbine will be cooled down by the steam in the Rankine cycle. Okay. So you have, let, let's follow the, the, the diagram here. You have cold water here, low pressure. Then you compress with a pump. Okay, you pump your water. You have, in this point here, you have high pressure, low temperature. Okay, 
So water is heated in the regenerative boiler. So you have here at point three, you have high pressure, high temperature water in the form of steam, actually. Then the steam is expanded in the turbine. So here in four, you have low pressure and some temperature, uh, liquid water with some temperature around uh, 100 degrees. The remaining heat is rejected in a condenser, okay? And the source of heat for, for transforming liquid water to steam comes from the exhaust gas. So it's the same. You uh, inject, you, you get air, you compress, so you, you have uh, high pressure and uh, uh, not so high temperatures, then you absorb heat, you have very high temperatures and low, uh, high pressure. Expansion in the turbine, here you have low pressure and still very hot gases, okay? So that's the, the idea. And in terms of uh, the thermodynamic cycle, you see the Brighton cycle here. So in point eight, the idea is to build a, a heat exchanger that will get some amount of this heat and inject that to the water cycle, to the Rankine cycle. So our Rankine cycle is built here between the maximum, the Rankine's maximum temperature actually corresponds, is equal to the uh, temperature of the exhaust gases, okay? So the temperature at eight is equal, equal to the temperature of three. The temperature of the gas here is equal to the temperature of, of water here. Just one observation. This actually is, a, is an approximation. When you have actual heat exchanger, even if uh, the temperature, if the area of the heat exchanger is goes to infinity, this is not possible because of the differences in heat capacities. Okay, I'm going to show you this, and we're going to make some calculations in a, in a future class. But today, it's sufficient that we, we assume this simplification, okay? Because the difference is not very, very significant. Our calculations for the purposes of today's class is okay, okay? So the temperature in 3 is equal to the temperature in 8. And the same thing, huh? okay? Uh, yeah. Okay, in the temperature in one is equal to the temperature in five. Okay, so uh, the the heat exchanger, the heat exchange between the gas and the steam is in this region, and the point is that the amount of heat that's going to be rejected, it's not from eight to five, but from nine to five. Okay. So you reject a lot less heat because you are able to exploit some amount of this heat. Okay, so the calculations are here. As I said, I'm not going to, to elaborate on that. The only observation is that uh, we assume that T8 is equal to T3. So when we do the calculation, we have to set this temperature from the from air, yeah, we had to inject this temperature here. Okay, and as I'm going to show in a, in a future class, we have actually we have to make some uh, actual calculation in order to take account to take into account the differences in heat capacities. Okay, okay. So the same procedure. Uh, yeah. Well, this. One step uh, before, before we're able to calculate the, uh, the efficiency, the overall efficiency of the cycle, we must calculate the, the relation between the, the mass flow rates of the gas and of the water, of the both working fluids. Okay? We can do that by applying the first law to the regenerator here. Okay? So the heat exchanged in the regenerator, okay, is equal to the delta H of the gas, that's the mass flow rate of the gas, times 
the enthalpy variation of the gas. Okay, this is equal to the mass flow rate of the steam times the delta H of the steam. Okay, so when we rearrange this expression, we obtain the relation between the mass flow rates in terms of the variations in the enthalpies. Okay, and these enthalpies, all the enthalpies, we were able to calculate a priori. Okay. So moving further, uh, our efficiency is the amount of heat absorbed from the source, okay, the external source, okay, times the net quantities, uh, the total net quantities of work, okay. So in the gas cycle is W78 minus the, the work produced in the turbine subtracted uh, the work consumed in the compressor and likewise this is the work produced in the turbine and W12 is the work consumed by the pump okay so when we write these works and heat absorption in terms of enthalpies as we did in the previous cycles we uh, yeah this one step that I skipped uh, dividing by the gas flow rate, you get this mv divided by mg, okay, which we just calculated here, okay. So when we replace all the enthalpies that we get, okay, and by replacing the mass flow relations here, we get this final expression, which we can calculate because we know all the enthalpies. Okay, so making all the calculations, the relation, the mass, mass flow relation, in terms of kilograms of steam divided by kilograms of air, is 0 0.071, and by replacing all the enthalpies, we get 62.5 percent. That's the overall thermodynamic efficiency of the combined gas steam cycle, combine it, brighton Rankine cycle. So when we compare all our cycles, let's start by, by the kernel cycle, we have 76, that's the maximum uh, possible efficiency, okay? Uh, the Brighton got 56, which is good, but not as good as 76%. Rankine was the worst because actually 1,000 degrees is too much for a Rankine cycle, and our gas steam cycle uh, attained 62.5 percent, which is fairly close to the maximum uh, theoretical efficiency for the Carnot cycle. Okay, with the additional advantage that uh, well, the the Rankine cycle is uh, sometimes it's used because in addition, uh, sometimes you use uh, Rankine cycle, even if it's uh, if it's if its efficiency is not as high as we would expect. You use a Rankine cycle because you also need the heat rejected by the Rankine cycle. Uh, for instance, in a sugarcane mill, you use this rejected heat, this heat, this heat here, okay, in order to to heat water, for instance, for your mills, or for your diffuser, or for uh, ethanol, for, for separating ethanol from the wine, okay? So you need energy in the form of heat, and you can obtain that from a Rankine cycle, but also from the combined gas cycle. Yeah? That's cogeneration, okay? So, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, you see that uh, I'm going back some, some, a lot of slides, uh, just to remind you the first efficiencies that I showed you here. Remember, in 2100, it is, it is expected to attain efficiencies between 60 and uh, and 70 percent. Okay, and what we get between 60 and 70 percent. Let me go to that la last slide uh, here. 
Yeah. Okay. So 76 is is the maximum uh, theoretical efficiency. We got 62. That's fairly fairly good. Okay. Actually, if we we can do better than that, I'm going to to leave you a suggestion. If you are interested in in playing with these equations, what you can do, for instance, here. Uh, well, not here. Here. Sorry. You could try to change your your cycle because you know Rankine cycle. It's terrible for for that uh, for 1,000 degrees. So you could change, try to change your Brighton cycle, for instance, by instead of instead of uh, compressing from the lower pressure directly to the higher pressure. Okay, oops, sorry. Directly to here, I don't remember 100 bar, for instance. You could compress. Uh, to a lower pressure, for instance, from one bar, one bar to, sorry, from one bar to, let's say, 50 bar or 20 bar to a, to a, a pressure lower than the maximum, you can uh, then, sorry, let me erase that, then you absorb heat, that's my fan, then you absorb heat to attain one 1,000 degrees, and then you reject. I don't know if you if you can see, but you you have an, a different cycle here. You have a different cycle, which can be um, which can be more efficient than the one that I just calculated. Okay, so that's a suggestion that I I leave with you, and there is actually. Um, a specific pressure here which produces maximum efficiency. Okay, I'm just going to state like this. I'm going to, um, to propose that you uh, study to, to, to go after the information, and then in the next class I can elaborate on this. Okay, I can show you what what could be this this pressure? The re actually the relation between the lower and the higher pressure. Okay, so my point is that you can, even though we obtained a, a fairly good efficiency for the combined cycle, uh, you still can improve this number by changing, by trying to adapt the the cycles, both both cycles, uh, the gas cycle and the steam cycle. Because you 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 observe that I um, stated I, I uh, arbitrated some some parameters and you can do it di do differently in order to increase this efficiency, knowing that you cannot exceed seventy six point six percent. Okay. So uh, let me see. Yeah, I'm I'm right on time. If there is no doubts. Okay, anybody wants to ask a question? Okay, so next week we're going to focus on uh, more specifics. We're going to, I'm going to show you a gas power plant and the biomass power plant. Try to, to analyze the differences to make some calculations with this theoretical framework that I just gave you today. Okay? Okay, so if there's no doubt. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for listening and for not sleeping. <laughs> okay, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, and see you next week.